know, we're going, we're moving from a tightly controlled financial system with a lot of regulatory activity, but it's a closed system. And now we're talking about money on the internet. And I think that's what a lot of people are struggling with. Welcome to the Rain Insights Podcast. I'm Emily Donahue. U.S. regulators recently asked lawmakers to speed up regulations for a type of cryptocurrency. With the explosive growth and adoption of crypto as currency, whether tied to stable currency or not, red flags are being raised about the volatile nature of cryptocurrencies and their potential for major risk to the global financial system. So what's to be done? Well, that's the focus of this episode of Crypto Corner, Rain's podcast exclusively focused on cryptocurrencies. Host David Lawrence is joined by Joe Hanvey from Falcon X and Tim Murphy of Consortium Networks. Let's listen. Tim and Joe, uh, once again, thanks for reconvening uh, at the Crypto Corner. Uh, coincidentally, um, today's headlines uh, were about uh, stablecoin, the potential threats to the financial uh, system, concerns about fraud, uh, et cetera. And uh, again, uh, with the increasing popularity of cryptocurrencies and also stable coins, um, somewhat um, propitious that we're able to have you um, on our broadcast today. So maybe we can start with a uh, larger point, um, which is the efforts of regulators and the efforts of the private sector to get regulations right uh, without stifling innovation and without stifling what I'll refer to as uh, the benefits broadly that technology can provide. And so maybe uh, I'll start with you, Tim, uh, and Joe, you're in the center of this at Falcon X. Maybe to sort of give our audience an overview of what have been some of the regulatory concerns historically, currently, and uh, the various approaches that really are required uh, in the face of what is increasingly popular uh, technology. Thanks, David, and thanks for having us again, and and hi, Joe. Um, Look, I I think it's best to, as you set that scene setter, to really you know, go back to, you know, the other podcast we have and we had and, and talked about, you know, how cryptocurrency, the history of cryptocurrency, where we think it's where we think it's headed. And when we go back there and we talk about where we think it's headed, we I think we all know that have been in this space in the, the what I would call the uh, financial networks of the past and what the financial networks are going to look like in the future. And this, you know, cryptocurrency craze that's just exploding around the the globe that's potentially going to disrupt, you know, monetary policy across the globe. And a lot of countries are are struggling, you know, how do you put regulation in place, you know, to make sure there's safeguards so people can trust it? Because everything we do in life is based around trust. And we talked to, we touched on that just a little bit last time, but I think it's very important to continue to push that. Um, and it's not only about just to trust so people can invest in it, but then you've got open competition, you know, among different products and platforms. And is everybody on the same playing field, just like the financial system is today, even though this is clearly one of the most destructive things we've seen since the internet, you know, we're going, we're moving from a tightly controlled financial system with a lot of regulatory activity, but it's a closed system. And now we're talking about money on the internet. And I think that's what a lot of people are struggling struggling with. But I think from my work in this space, you know, Americans would welcome the safeguards around this because I think it'll give confidence in uh, retail investors as well as institutional investors that we're seeing um, to actually in, invest in it, whether it's for, you know, safekeeping, whether it's for interest bearing, whether it's for transactional activity as we kind of develop those different areas around cryptocurrency. But I would say that having worked in government for many years and working now in the, the in the private sector in the AML, uh, you know, anti money laundering and CTF counterfeit finance space, is that we we do in this space I think have to avoid. And I think you mentioned it. You know, I would just call it over regulation, right? It, we have to get this right because the older regulatory frameworks, you know, just may not work because this is a it's a whole new um, way to do this. And, you know, if you looked even today with the number of investors and blockchain firms, we still haven't developed a clear regulatory framework because the SEC, you know, typically classifies 
cryptocurrency security, the commodity futures trading calls, you know, Bitcoin a commodity, Treasury calls it, Treasury calls it a, a currency. Um, and you can just see that we're, we're struggling over definitions. The IRS classifies it as property for federal income tax purposes. So there's all these issues that have to be worked out in the nomenclature and how we're going to name things and what are they going to be used for. So I think it's important to start there that that we need to start there with the both like public and David, you're big on this and Rain's big on this. How do we solve these problems through crowdsourcing and how do we solve these problems through public private partnership, right? Because there are exchanges and, and investors that do want some type of safeguards and regulatory uh, regimes around this, this new money, if you will, uh, on the internet. So I'll start with that. And, Go to Joe, but that, that'd be my open statement. We have to get this right, and because just like you said, we don't want to stifle the innovation in it because it has just been phenomenal over these last ten years to watch the innovation in this space, and it just seems to continue to explode. So, Tim, um, before turning to Joe, would it be uh, fair to offer this simple statement that the role of regulation is not to stifle innovation? but it is to protect consumers and to ensure, obviously, against the issues of fraud, ensure suitability, and uh, ensure that as people invest their capital, they have sort of a full understanding of where they're, they're putting their money. Is that too much of an overstatement? No, I think to, to me, that's what the regulatory frameworks really are, are for. So I think that's a perfect statement to frame this. Okay. And uh, Joe, Tim noted the often ideal of a working uh, a work between the private and public sector, the mutuality of interests in getting things right. And I know you've been one of the leaders in this space. Uh, would love to get your perspective on the dialogue um, that you've been able to, I'll use the word convene, uh, your perceptions about how regulators are thinking about things. And um, I'll sort of quote a, uh, a friend of mine, it shouldn't take a crisis uh, to get reasonable and rational uh, regulations in place. But it'd be great to have your perspectives. You know, I was at a uh, conference uh, last week and one of the speakers said, you know, to the crypto, crypto audience, the people were trying to ask about who our regulator is, who's responsible. And he said, you'll find out who your regulator is as soon as um, there's an enforcement action because everyone is going to be your regulator. And and it really spoke to me because I'm looking at the, uh, you know, what they call the outfit soup of law enforcement agencies and regulators. And my reaction to the uh, regulatory concerns is I look to where the time and the money is being spent. So the time being the law enforcement agencies, the enforcement actions, I look to uh, DOJ, I look to FinCEN, and I'm looking to OFAC as we were talking uh, before the call, uh, before the podcast. And the regulatory concerns from a, um, you know, from a spend standpoint, you know, it's just looking at some of this and I thought you and Tim would be, uh, you know, interested in seeing, hearing this, but, you know, chain analysis, it's all public information. Uh, the U.S. government has spent over $11 million, <clears throat> excuse me, in contracts with them. Uh, Cypher Trace, over $8 million. Elliptic, over $3 million. And each of the agencies from, you know, the, that, that access this, and it's public, but I won't be talking through it here. Each of the agencies that access it, um, they're really focusing on this right now. And you would imagine some of the typical players. But that's where I find uh, we look to, you know, the guidance of the past from the anti-money laundering 2001 uh, the passage of the Patriot Act to be uh, maybe a guide in this. But back then you had all of these, you know, judiciary and financial services subcommittee. They had bills out there that they were uh, discussing and, and then the events happened and then they passed them here in this space you're having actually a lot of the dialogue occurring that the members of Congress and the regulators are thinking. They're, they're thinking on public podiums. They're, they're speaking out there saying, I think this is a security. I think this is a commodity. And I think this is what firms have to do. And, you know, from our perspective, you know, we look at this and we say, okay, what's good risk management? 
and okay, it needs to have a governance framework. It needs to have a management committee. It needs to have, you know, your risk assessment, all the good stuff that, you know, you could talk to and Tim could talk to. Um, but when I look at that, we're not trying to do it alone. And to your point that you just raised, you know, we do it through working groups. You know, I, I, I convene with my my colleagues, my peers in the industry, and we meet on a monthly basis and we just talk through, okay, what are you doing for OFAC sanctions? What are you doing for due diligence? Um, what is law enforcement doing? You know, I referenced the last time we spoke to IRS CI. Now we're going to talk to the, you know, uh, representative from the DOJ and say, okay, what are kind of the red flags that you're seeing and things of that nature. So. Um, it's it's an interesting time to watch the regulatory development uh, while it's unfolding in front of us and being able to be a part of it. But that's that's my reaction to that, David. So um, both of you have highlighted um, something, and maybe it it, it starts with um, a little bit of definition. And what I'm hearing both of you uh, say is that because of the various regulatory agencies and their mandates writ large, um, there seems to be continuing confusion in the marketplace about what crypto is. Is it a currency? Is it a security? Is it a commodity? Is it simply a payments method, et cetera? And so um, how it gets defined may ultimately help the government and, and, and various governments and the private sector come up with rational um, regulations. But so I guess my question is, do you see any progress on that gating issue of even defining it and finding which regulatory box uh, it should be in? Look, this is Tim. I th think for me, uh, I think we're finding dis. I don't want to say disparate, but I think we're finding each individual entity that has some type of regulatory responsibility or enforcement type responsibility, whether it's the SEC, whether it's CFTC, you know, uh, FinCEN and, and IRS, they, they, they're defining it in their own lanes. I don't think we have a, a larger, that I've been aware of, um, I think Janet Yellen has put together a group that's, that's looking at this, but I, I don't know if they're looking at it in the way you just described, like really defining it. It's like any problem you want to solve, you have to define it first, right? You have to define it. You have to analyze it. You have to look at the impact. And then you start developing solutions around that. So I, although I think we've made progress um, with the SEC looking at something in the way it looks at it, Treasury calling it a currency, looking at the way it looks at it, the problem is it's it's slow, uneven, it's disparate, and as slow as we are reacting in government, which is historically the nature of technology and government, right? To, to the government, whether it's the congressional action, whether it's executive orders, whether it's government making decisions, and not just the United States around the world, it's always lag. Technology always leads, like it does everything else in the world. And what I worry about is this space is so innovative and these things don't fit neatly within their current financial regulatory frameworks, but they continue to grow. I mean, you, we're not even talking about, um, you know, we're talking to talk about stable coins a little, little bit and Joe can add a, a lot of color to that with the, with the tether and circle, but DeFi, right? The digital finance world that's out there that this is really takes out the middle uh, third party when they're doing uh, financing. And the rates of returns we're getting with some of these exchanges, um, I think Gemini offers uh, just on their, their Gemini dollar, you know, an 8% return just for holding it. So uh, as quick as the technology is moving, we're very slow even to, even to keep up with just Bitcoin. How do you even regulate Bitcoin? And now, and the next thing I'm hearing about, and I don't have much insight, but I will because we'll study it, is the social finance aspect. That's supposed to be... The next boom, you had uh, you know cryptocurrencies, you got DeFi, you've got NFTs, which people are trying to wrap their heads around, and now you've got social finance. Um, so what I will tell you is, yes, small progress, but we really need to wrap our arms around this with these groups in government. And I think part of the 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 slow period of doing this is you just said it. I don't think people understand it, right? This is this is a big movement driven by technology, driven by engineers, um, driven by people that understand this world. 
and yet we don't have enough people in, in our government organizations. They're just catching up to speed now or just learning and really digging in to all the different innovation and aspects um, of the cryptocurrency world. Joe, you're kind of the eyes or ears uh, with the regulators uh, because of all the work you're doing. I'm just curious um, what you would add to that. Um, what the regulators say matters, right? And what I mean is, you know, they might not be our regulators, but if they're giving a speech, any regulator, any senior authority is giving a speech uh, in the U.S., the Fed, the OCC, um, internationally, you know, Bank of England, whatever it might be, we're going to be listening to how they are actually defining what uh, crypto is or digital assets or virtual currencies, uh, however we want to refer to that. And that's how we're trying to, um, you know, make sure we maneuver uh, successfully. You know, there, there are sound risk management principles, though. You know, at the end of all this, it does come down to risk management. You know, I referenced just briefly before, you know, governance and oversight and, you know, a tone at the top. All that stuff is very important. And all that stuff is typically pointed to in enforcement actions, uh, whatever the enforcement action might be. You know, the, the DOJ has their rules on what a, you know, and Tim could speak to that, you know, what a compliance program, you know, should and feel uh, look like. Um, but, you know, the it brings though the parable of the blind man and the elephant, you know, and each of them a touching a different part of it. Uh, each of them being each jurisdiction, each country, each sovereign uh, area, and based on um, you know what they're touching in their area, you know whether it's a tusk, whether it's a you know a toenail, whether it, whatever it might be, and then that's how they're describing the elephant. And you know each country is going to say, okay we believe that crypto should and feel and act like this uh, because we wanted to interact or not interact with our uh, you know, economy in this manner. Some countries might prohibit it altogether and not care to define it. Um, but in the US and you know, in Singapore and you know, a, lot of, um, a lot of other countries, they're actually saying, hey, we like this. We see it as, again, as an asset class. We want uh, people to start trading this responsibly. We also want you to, you know, uh, have some oversight because of what you touched on earlier, Dave. You know, the uh, protection, protection of individual investors is extremely important. You know, um, when, when you look at these high uh, rates of return, you know, whether you're staking a coin or something like that, uh, it's, you know, it, it goes against some of the red flags, at least on the securities world, where, you know, if you're expecting a high return for something or, you know, someone's promising you something, that's that's a bad thing. You, you know, it should be a red flag. But yet the last year and a half in crypto, that was actually the norm. You know, hey, if you stake with us, this is the kind of return that you'll get, um, you know, and it's it's so we're still trying to figure out. Uh, what that definition is. But regardless of the definition, there are certain sound principles that must be in place, whether we call ourselves uh, an MSB, a broker dealer, or a bank. Joe, I think to that point as well, you know, when you when you talked about, you know, the regula regulations and starting from the top in a company, and I, you know, I think that's right. And I made a point earlier, and I just won't want to come back to it, because part of the, the regulations are the safety, the trust. But you know, for work that you're doing, right? You you know this space, you're working in this space, you're making sure, you know, you comply with, you know, KYC procedures, sanctions list screening, keyword, IP blocking. You, you're doing all the right things because you know that's the, the regulatory framework you most likely um, are going to be observed from the government as, you know, have you put these things in place. Um, my concern is, as we continue to do this for U.S. companies, um, from the U.S., there's still no international standard. And so now we get into this, and I've seen this in actually the, the financial space with fintechs, up-and-coming fintechs, um, doing cross-border transfers and, and the like. There's not an either, even playing field for competition. And that's what the other thing that I think would be very, very helpful. If you can get the rules right, people can compete on an even playing field. And that's Tim, that's a great point. Remember when we were talking through the issue of uh, scalability, right? We talked about trust and scalability and you have to actually here you have, uh, you know, the concept of the blockchain, not the concept, the technical uh, execution of it. And it, it, it's scalable because of the way that interacts with every country, every every person uh, the same way. 
So similarly, regulations do have to actually connect for what you just raised. But actually, I pause because they don't have to, right? A country like China could say, hey, we don't want this. A country like the U.S. says, you know, we don't want this or we do want this. And it has to look like this. And in order to operate here, you have to do the certain thing. But in order for it to be scalable, it can't have um, the limitations of, hey, can I onboard this client from this country? Or can I onboard this client, you know, that's involved in this token? Those are two different scenarios that require us to stop and think and evidence. And um, you're right, you, you know, we have to have a lot of that uniformity. Tim, I was coming, um, you know, I, I was, I won't name firms, but there was a, an enforcement action uh, against a, a firm for OFAC purposes. And the firm actually already had screening in place, but they had additional data. And the additional data is where uh, OFAC said, you know what, guys, um, you should have known. And it kind of brings back, you know, the theory of collect knowledge, uh, things like that. But, you know, you should have known and you should have screened the metadata. And that's all right if we're actually held to certain standards and OFAC is strict liability and might be a poor one. We're talking about regulations um, as an example, but you need the guidance from the regulators. You need the guidance um, because then there are board members like, you know, yourself, Tim, who will guide and say, hey, Joe, what's going on? What are you doing with this? How are you managing that risk? How are you getting ahead of it? How are you getting behind it? You know, or are you behind it? How are you remediating out of it? Um, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, evolution of the regulations to watch. Yeah, so let me jump in uh, because I'm listening very intently to what you guys are saying. And uh, by the way, just for the benefit of the audience, um, Joe's reference to OFAC, uh, that's the um, basically the acronym for economic sanctions and uh, the various prohibitions that the Treasury Department and other related agencies issue about dealing with various uh, or not dealing with various countries and counterparties and things like that, and it's a it's a entire compliance infrastructure that relates to know your customer and sort of whom you can do business with and what kind of business you can do. So, uh, a trap for the unwary. But I'm, I, I want to take away a couple of themes. Okay, number one, uh, we're not we're not there, we're not even close yet to figuring out a rational regulatory scheme. Two, um, um, you know, the term, when everybody owns something, nobody owns it. And so this notion, Joe, you cited, um, when there's a misstep, I'm, I'm paraphrasing now your point, when there's a misstep, you'll find out who your regulator is. Well, that's not, um, I don't know if that's a formu any formula that any business would embrace or any sort of group of consumers would want to embrace. Uh, because that sort of suggests it'll take a, you know, a some kind of an accident or a crisis um, before there's intervention. Three, no matter whether you call this a security or a currency or an asset class, we actually have the existing analogs uh, in our um, sort of in our banking business, our brokerage business, our investment banking businesses, etc for a rational regulatory framework. We just haven't um, applied it yet and given clear direction. And maybe, you know, the issue is if we have too many regulations, we'll stifle innovation, but it just strikes me we have the analogs out there and to figure out, you know, sort of uh, a light regulatory scheme that nonetheless addresses some of the most important issues about transparency and disclosure and understanding how much leverage is in the market and anti-fraud provisions and KYC, know your customer and sanctions compliance, that in light of the size of this market is overdue. And I wanna just read to you again, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't wanna chase the headlines, uh, but today, again, coincidentally with this broadcast, um, was the headline, Regulators Sound the Alarm on Stable Coins. And I'll ask you to define that term, but you know, basically it's, it's cryptocurrency that is linked to some other uh, denomination, uh, often the US dollar, but can be linked to something else that is viewed as a, uh, a source of uh, stable value. But uh, underneath the headline, a fast-growing part of the cryptocurrency industry needs more oversight 
the Treasury Department warns. And to your point, Joe, about the regulators speaking, and Tim, you're constantly meeting and listening very closely to what they have to say, but I'll, I'll just basically summarize here, is that um, financial regulators have urged lawmakers to act fast on legislation to address the rising risk of stable coins. This type of cryptocurrency, backed one-on-one -on -one by a stable asset like the dollar, making it more practical as a means for trades and transactions, has obviously been booming. Uh, apparently, there's about 100, by estimates of the Treasury, $130 billion is now in uh, worth of stable coins are in circulation. They cite to companies like Tether and Circle, which are not banks, and technically they are tech companies that sell online services, but they don't have any rules or guidelines. And specifically, in an eagerly anticipated report that the Treasury Department released on Monday, meaning yesterday, the officials warn that without, very clearly, without more oversight, the rise in reliance on stable coins could result in bank runs, consumer abuse and payment snafus, and potentially threaten the wider financial system. So maybe underscoring the points that you are making about the need for uh, regulation in this space, but yet we don't have that action. And I'd be curious whether you think a report by the Treasury Department will be the catalyst, and if so, what might that look like? Tim, I'll uh, jump in on this one, and then um, we can go back and forth. But there is a, a few things that stuck out, David. Um, the first is my experience, my world, when I was engaging in stable coins for about two years. Um, the way that it was, the way that it is uh, presented, right? It's tether, it's pegged to the U.S. dollar in this case, and the other case was pegged to the yen. In this volatile marketplace, the on ramps, the off ramps, everything that we're hearing about to get to the fiat dollar, and I'm getting to the point in a moment. The need for something, and we call them stable coins, was created so that traders didn't have to go in and out um and lose some of the you know the just just lose something on the trade you know with the volatility that was going on with the particular coin so the stable coins allowed you know allowed these traders to actually still stay within the network of the chain and and not go in and out of it and actually quickly settle so you just from my world that's what stable coins meant to me and i bring in the parable of the elephant again right so in my world we published the um you know, the uh, end of month US dollar uh, pegged uh, to the stable coins. We only minted enough that were actually pegged to the dollar. Uh, we were a trust company. Um, we had oversight by the state, um, you know, and that is the world in which I view and that's the way I grew up over the last couple of years. So when I'm hearing, you know, dollars can be actually, you know, in different types of uh, securities, you know, then I'm putting on my FINRA hat and thinking of net capital and thinking of haircuts. I'm like, all right, you know, that, that, that could, you could put something in a commercial paper or money market, maybe to get more of a yield. But regardless, um, the one-to-one -one ratio has to be there for it to be a useful and reliable and a trustworthy token, in this case, stablecoin. Um, transparency that's what it's all about right you, you mentioned transparency that's what this is about you know it has to be tied to it so would treasuries report influence the regulators you, you, you darn right it would you know tfi rights uh, treasury financial intelligence it's over ofac and fincen um and most of what people talk about in crypto are ofac and fincen uh, KYC and surveillance through way of uh, OVAC and Vincent. Um, you know, and, and I know working for a member of Congress, you know, you're not just creating a bill uh, based on your good governance thoughts. You unfortunately are creating a bill based on pressure from, uh, you know, an organization. That organization doesn't have to be a bad one, i.e. A, a lobbyist trying to get something. It could be a law enforcement agency. It can be Treasury to say, hey, members of Congress, we need to actually accelerate this bill because we actually are stunted or we need another tool to actually address this particular area um, or the State Department might be uh, reaching out. So, yes, 100 percent of Treasury, uh, you know, report will be digested. You used and, um, you know, implemented. But those, those are my two thoughts, uh, two long thoughts on that, Tim. 
Yeah, look, it, you're well more versed having worked in the space than, than I will other be. I mean, I, I agree it's uh, tether and, and, uh, and now circle used for donning and, and off-ramping, um, medium of exchange to be able to continue to, to move quickly in the space. And I, so I think there, there does need to be, you and I would just sound money or reserved back money, and I, I think you know, Tether's gotten into some, some issues recently with the state of New York AG, and I think there's been uh, some other um, regulatory actions taken against them for not being fully compliant, whether, you know, with what they were saying on how their how Tether was backed, whether it was cash or whether it was other type of securities that backed it one for one. Um, it was interesting, David, you said the news articles, because I, I don't know if any anybody, if you saw CNBC this morning, I think they had Circle on, and they were putting them, you know, running them through the middle about, you know, auditing and attestation of, you know, is there is this stable coin backed one to one, um, and really good answers about the auditing around Circle and and um, and what they're doing to make sure that, uh, you know, it's backed one to one. So I think it gets back to yes, we have to move fast. You know, it's it's interesting that we're talking about this, and, and Joe, I think you'll agree with this. It's interesting that we're talking about. Um, making sure that it's backed right so we don't have this financial crisis that's actually what caused this move into cryptocurrency was a financial crisis because the the financial system wasn't backed in the appropriate manner which increased regulation which caused you know making making sure the banks had enough for the big financial institutions had enough reserves and now we're back at that even in the crypto space. So there's there are there are some parallels, and I think that gets back to our original conversation that we have to have some type of regulation um, in this space so that people can feel comfortable that we won't have another financial uh, crisis and a run on the banks because you know a stable corn you know was not backed in in the manner in which it should be. And let me just I'll, I'll add. A a simplistic lens because both of you guys are making excellent points. The, the question here is when somebody invests in a stable coin and it's pegged to, let's just say, the US dollar, for every coin that they buy that's worth a dollar, is there in fact a dollar being held by the platform to back this up? And that's been the issue and there's been ambiguity and a lot of consumer confusion and uh, you've both in a very politic fashion have alluded to uh, tr issues of transparency and auditability around that premise. And I think, you know, and I'll, you know, I'm sure uh, for our next broadcast we'll, we're going to digest the Treasury Department report, but there are other reports that are coming out. But I think what is also transpiring here as people try to understand what this is all about and Tim, you trust you, you. You highlighted something, both in the last broadcast and today, about trust. And you know, in part, what was a catalyst for this is uh, obviously people feel they can make money from it, whether it's a guaranteed eight percent return or in the volatility of, of, of you know crypto going, you know, to thirty to sixty, back down, back up, etc. Uh, obviously, people are focused on making money, but but a significant catalyst around this has got to be, um, and in my conversations I've heard this, you know, a bit of distrust for governments, the institutions, their ability to print money, their balance sheets, and uh, wanting to delever from any one government. And so, you know, I didn't see sort of in, in, in the need for regulations um, I haven't seen yet, Joe, maybe you've heard this in your discussions, I haven't seen yet uh, an acknowledgement of why this has become popular, These, the, why cryptocurrency writ large has become popular. And I think we ignore uh, the underlying thesis around distrust of governmental institutions at our peril. And I think it's a recurring theme that you see everything with vaccines and uh, other types of um, questions around information that comes from the government, etc. So I'll put a marker there for maybe our future discussions. Uh, but the other aspect that I think the regulators have yet to 
or they're grappling with, and it's very, very difficult, is to understand the first, second, or third order or fourth orders of consequences uh, in the marketplace, meaning that what if the following scenario happens? How much leverage is there? Have um, both personal as well as the platforms. And what would happen if there was all of a sudden a de I'll use the word decompression of the value of cryptocurrency if there were, you know, the ten a, you know, margin calls or all of a sudden people didn't have the wealth that they thought they had, um, had leveraged or levered other assets for purposes of purchase and speculation and what have various institutions, uh, including banks that are now getting involved in this, uh, how have they managed their, their book as well? And so these are very difficult and complex uh, questions, I know. And so I want to uh, end on a note to thank Tim, you, and Joe, because you have been honest brokers and uh, conveners of um, important and honest, I'll call it facts and intelligence, in the dialogue between regulators and the private sector, but also trying to understand uh, what we're dealing with. And if I could, I'd like to give each of you, you know, the final word and, and maybe uh, focus the audience on what you're looking, looking at over the next couple of weeks, what you're expecting, what you're worried about, you know, whatever sort of aspect of that you'd like to address. Joe, why don't I start with you and close with uh, Tim? All right. You're right. There's a lot to unpack with what you um, talked to. Uh, so I'll actually um, respond in, a, in, a, in just one way for the last few minutes. You know, when, when the expansion of crypto, people are chasing yield, they're looking for diversity in their you know, investments, they believe in a project or a protocol, they're uh, for privacy, or they don't want to, to your point that you just raised, uh, rely on an institution or a government uh, for their financial uh, stability or financial instability um, and security. And, you know, just, uh, just I was listening to Tor Bear. He's from the uh, token called Secret, Secret Network. And he raised a couple of things, which I think goes to the uh, items that I think it goes to some of the stuff that you were uh, talking to right now. Without, again, naming names, he was talking about multinational corporations and how they exist based off of obtaining data and using that data that is our uh, our data points, our behaviors, whatever it might be, you know, and then it's sold and packaged and sold. And all we have to do is look at uh, NPPI, you know, requirements, uh, look at laws, look at um, what's in the press for the last 10 years to see, wow, whenever there's a break in that data, there's a break in trust with an institution and, and that institution is slapped on the wrist and they're fined. And what you'll have is, you know, a, a, a blockchain now where, you know, Tor was talking about that allows you to have that kind of um, permission to give your data away, which those permissions, we already exist in contracts or click this button here, or click it there, but it's more nuanced. And what we could talk to over the next, you know, um, couple of uh, episodes, right, is to as to whether or not secrecy is, um, you know, privacy issues are the same term as um, everybody saying out in the press, because when you look at their token, it's not. When you talk about other tokens uh, in the terms of privacy, they are. That's where all the bad stuff happens. You know, and I'm, I'm just using secret as the example, right? Tor Bear's comments rather as the example that there's a lot of um, lot lot to unpack out there. And you know, you, you touched on all of it, but that's those are my thoughts on the last couple of minutes. Tim, um, thanks, Joe. I agree with everything David you said because I, I still get back to and I love the way you 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 know phrased it around around the trust and, and trusting different institutions and in, in the government. Um, so I just want to close it on since we talked a lot about regulation, we talked a lot about OFAC and some of the other entities that that regulate. I think what people need to understand that this isn't about no regulation or a ton of regulation. It's making sure that there's a public private understanding and regulators start to understand that. This is a different type of product on a different infrastructure, an open in infrastructure called the Internet. And although they've, they've regulated the Internet before, um, this is a financial product. And we can apply these old um, historical regulatory um, regimes to this type of product. We have to be careful about how we apply 
regulatory enforcement or regulatory regimes around that. And I think the regulators would really, if we could really do this right, they would get a lot of private sector expertise to help them map this out, right? To uh, look at the evolving landscape, what's around the corner, you know, just to make sure we we avoid the unintentional damage that we talked about at, at the beginning. And I think the private sector companies, and I think you're seeing this with some of the big U.S. exchanges, um, you know, they want to be involved in the in, in the rulemaking process and the lobbying process. And then they want to be able to test out some of these solutions and work with the government. And that's it's this isn't a us versus them. We have to figure this out to have this safe environment for retail and institutions if this is going to work long time. Look, it's moving. Um, I don't see it being put back into the bottle. And so we have to rapidly move at a pace that we've never moved before around regulations. And we're going to make mistakes um, and we got to be able to pivot quickly, just like a startup would and and make the changes that are needed in this space. All right. Well, thank you both. And I look forward to the continued conversation. I'll take your metaphor a little bit uh, further, the um, uh, genie back in the bottle. Let's call it toothpaste in the tube. Some of it may squirt out on the sink and get lost, but uh, it's going to be out there. And I agree with both of you. Uh, so thanks um, very, very much. I'm going to leave the, um, our audience and you guys with a question. Maybe we can address it in our next call. Um, if the U.S. government had issued um, its version of Bitcoin, do you think it would have attracted the, I'll call it the interest adoption that uh, Bitcoin has? or Ethereum for that matter. I didn't mean to focus on that. In other words, I'm going back to this question that I don't think has been sufficiently examined and is central to the regulatory scheme about the um, this, a, a sense of distrust around um, government institutions. So I'll leave the audience with that question for you to ponder. Um, Joe, Tim, again, thank you not only for your time today, but your continued service in this very, very important area. Take good care and stay safe. Thank you, David. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Bob. Tim Murphy is the CEO of Consortium Networks. Joe Hanvey is the Chief Compliance Officer at Falcon X. David Lawrence is the founder of RAIN. RAIN is a risk intelligence company that provides access to critical insights, analysis, and support to ensure business continuity and resilience for our members. We offer custom cyber risk monitoring, including tools to efficiently screen and analyze emerging risks for your business. Find out how Rain can help you power your business to success. Visit rainnetwork.com. That's R A N E network.com. I'm Emily Donahue. Thanks for listening. <laughs>